so back to basics, um, I'm going to be looking at the service level data, the basic, basic data that you collect yourselves, um, what you perhaps already collect as a routine or what you collect as uh, specific to something uh, that you need to know more about. So I've just split it into basic types, your routine data. Uh, sometimes people can forget that some of their routine data is actually very useful uh, if you start delving into that. And specific data, that's the, that's the stuff that you might be um, thinking is important. Okay, so yeah, uh, everyday data, all the stuff that you usually collect um, as a routine, usually most people collect demographics of some sort, You've, you're collecting ideas on how many people are using your service, what aspects of this, your service that they're using, um, you're collecting financial data, so you might be you might have data there available to work out what the costs of your service, or or split that into the different elements. What parts of your service are are costing uh, the most or the most efficient? Um, hopefully, also you're collecting some idea about the specific needs of your service users, um, particularly those around your particular service. So if it's a housing service, for example, you might be looking at what their current um, status of housing is and what they need. So a specific data might be things that we're looking, you're looking for effectiveness. So you want to be looking at um, your outcome success rates. So whatever your, your service is designed for, hopefully you're measuring um, how many people use your service with a successful outcome. Again, if it's housing, have they improved their housing level in some way or another? Then there are quality measures. How well are you delivering your service? So you're probably already collecting some kind of evaluation from service users, um, or satisfaction surveys from service users, um, it could be not necessarily service users, but it could also be people who are um, commissioning you to deliver that service and how how well they are seeing your efficiencies. Uh, and then your efficiency measures such as uh, did not attend rates might be particularly important to you. <clears throat> so I'm going to split them up into into two kinds of knowledge that what we want to know about in a service. That is who's benefiting and how are they benefiting? And when I do my second presentation, I'll give you a good example of how that information can actually be um, quite useful, but also quite controversial. So they're usually related to your service goals, your outcomes and impacts. Um, some people get confused about the difference of those things. So I'll try and separate those out as well. Um, basic outcomes are, um, are successfully used the service or successfully benefited from the service. And to get some information on that, we, we, can, we need to collect the basic demographics and things that are pertinent to your service. As I say, age and gender are typical. Um, type of need for that person. Uh, if I was running, let's say, a health and social care service, I'd want to know uh, what their what their specific health needs were, their social needs, um, what they're using the service for. Then, um, as we've seen, that geographic data can be very important. So, postcode area um, is very useful to see how much you're covering and whether you're covering people with a particular need. So socioeconomic status, for example. So how do they benefit? Um, what is the effect on, of the service? Did it work? Is it working for them? Is it meeting the need um, of the data you've collected on need? Is the service actually meeting that? And sometimes quite tricky to ask, um, especially quantitatively, how did it work? Sometimes you might need to explore that in a qualitative way of, okay, it did work. Somebody moved from unsafe housing to safer housing, but you want to know why, why what was it that gained that, uh, it, that improvement for them? Um, also, most importantly, what did not work? 
And again, a why question uh, is very often something you can explore qualitatively. <clears throat> okay, so uh, in out outcomes and impacts. Uh, the main outcomes are probably something to do with your, what your service delivers. So it's, example here is training community members for uh, delivering mental health first aid. So improving the referral to services, um, improving early, early referrals might be a particular outcome. Reducing, let's say, uh, deliberate self-harm in the community, seeing more self-help um, in the community might be your identified outcomes. But the impacts of that are tend to be related to the outcomes. The impacts would be things that are slightly harder to measure, but you can measure them specifically by identifying these. So there might be other benefits of the knock-on effects, if you like. So you've now got a wider community understanding of mental health. There might be an improved care pathway so that statutory services are seeing earlier referral or better referrals, and they're seeing um, an improved um, <clears throat> uptake of services. There might be increased community cohesion and collaboration, and maybe mutual aid groups have uh, started up. So these are, uh, sometimes I call them spin-offs from your outcomes, and it's showing that the impact of you achieving your outcomes is actually having an impact on wider issues. Okay, so what do you do with the data? Now, this is something that I'm going to go through um, in the second presentation, but I think my main message really here is that, that those basic data, basic data collection are actually gold dust. You can do a lot with the basics. Um, I think sometimes, especially smaller um, community enterprises, charities, and, uh, and self-help groups can think that all well, this data analysis is, is, is beyond them. Uh, and it's, it's, it's too complicated. So you've got to access, um, the, as they say, the sectoral data, which is useful, but sometimes you just need to look at what you're doing and you re realize that you've got a wealth of information there that you can do a lot with. So your basic analysis is what is working? What is it that your service is doing that is actually having a positive um, impact and outcome for the people using the service? It's important to look at who it works for. So that, that uh, collecting of basic demographic data, um, you're looking at not just who's using the service, but be mindful of who's not there, who are you not be able to reach, particularly if you've got a service that prides itself or has a mission statement to um, reach out to vulnerable people, to social excluded people. Um, it's, it's very easy to uh, uh, pick, the, pick the low hanging fruit, as some people say. Um, but are you actually achieving um, reach to the people that you want to reach? How it works. Sometimes you can collect that data and analyze that data quantitatively. So you can see what aspects of your service are impacting on people with most need, for example. But sometimes those how and why questions are um, more easily um, accessed by by using qualitative um, or, or data data that's that's about people's experience so you're asking people you know what what was the best element for you and things like that also of course if you're using uh, if you're collecting uh, good financial data you can then break that down into seeing how much some, some of that success costs um, and then you can you can you can do fairly simple uh, analysis of of your financial efficiency, how much that's um, you, how much value for money you're giving people who are either commissioning you or funding you, um, and people like that. Funders like <laughs> they like uh, cost benefit analysis. Okay. Um, I'm going to finish it there and uh, go into it a bit more depth in the second 
presentation, but this is just food for thought, thinking of valuing what you're already collecting and not, not needing to make it that complicated. I think we're going to be answering questions uh, later, but I'll have a look at the chat. Okay. Um, but now we're going to hand over and see a couple of case studies. So first we've got Mark um, from Circle telling us about his service and the data they use. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. I'll just uh, share the screen. So presumably everybody can hear. Um, so I'm Mark Wynn and I'm from an organisation called Haywood Middleton and Rochdale Circle. My colleague, Leanne, the, the lady who won the quiz, um, is also on the, the panel. She will answer any questions that you want to put on the, on the Q&A part um, in the chat sort of box, if you will. So basically, what does, what does who we circle, what do we do? And normally when I do a presentation, I start with a little quiz and I wasn't going to do that today. But then I, then I sort of realised, yeah, it sort of explains exactly who we are and what we do and why uh, data uh, is really important. So the, the three quiz questions, and you can post answers in the, the chat, is where would you go for a coffee or a meal with your friends? What year did the Sex Pistols play a Manchester Lesser Free Trade Hall in the Breakthrough Punk Rock concert? And what year did the Beatles last play the Cavern Club? So where would you go for a coffee with your friends? What year did the, Be uh, did the Sex Pistols play a Manchester Lesser Free Trade Hall? And when did the Beatles play the last concert at the Cavern Club? And so just going back to what Circle does, we're a membership organisation for the over 50s. We, we operate predominantly in the Rochdale borough, but we've got um, we've we've edged into areas of Oldham and into Bury. We're launching a North Manchester Circle with partners in Mosson and New Moston. We have a version in Haringey in London and we've done some stuff in Trafford uh, and we've got some other interesting parties going along. But basically we put on social events um, that members ask to do and they range from meeting up for a coffee, going out for a meal, walks, talks, quizzes, that sort of thing, through to, as you can see on the slide, hot air ballooning across the Lake District and indoor skydiving. And on this side, on the bottom right, you'll also you'll see a lady, uh, one of our members who abseiled down Rochdale Town Hall clock. Um, and, and we're really successful in what we do. We get really good attendances. The members suggest the event, so then we facilitate that. So it's very much member-driven. We do the things that they ask to put on the social calendar. Sorry. Mark, sorry to interrupt you, no slides showing. All right. Miss, I just come out of that. Sorry, my fault that I didn't share the. Just bear with me. Sorry, but apologies for the technical. We did practice this yesterday, so again, apologies for this. It's okay. So yeah, so I'll, I'll whistle stop through the, the slides that I mentioned. So yeah, so um, we, we put on these social events that members ask for, and as you can see from the slides now, um, they, they are they really broad range and. They're really popular, well attended, and that's driven by the fact that the members suggest the things that they want to do. The other part of what we do is practical. So we put on practical uh, support, so gardening, decorating, DIY, moving boxes, changing light bulbs, all the jobs, all the people struggle to get somebody out to come and do. We have a team that, that delivers that. Um, we also operate in a befriending programme, which we did. Uh, we do in partnership with Give and Take Care, which is based at Brunel University. It was developed along with Professor Heinz Wolf, those of you remember him. Um, unfortunately, he's passed away now. But we developed a, a unique befriending scheme along with that. And then the final thing, the final core part of what we do is the volunteer driver service. So volunteers drive as a service, take people to hospital, doctors, dentists, that sort of uh, activity, along with, uh, as well as to social events. Obviously, during um, the COVID, we've had to repurpose a lot of that. And so we do collection and delivery of prescriptions, emergency and, and standard food shops, delivery of PPE, um, information packs, craft packs, that sort of thing. And we've now been able to reintroduce some level of passenger transport. Um, and then we're all, they're all great things. But we always ask the question at Circle, does Circle work? Does the, do all them nice things? Do those going out for a coffee, going out for a meal, abseiling down Rochdale, 10 o'clock, do they make a difference? 
Uh, and initially we interviewed over 200 of our members. Uh, you, it was an externally verified um, survey and you can see that the, the scores are really good, nearly 80% report increased social activity, a similar figure for um, sort of over 50% improved self-confidence and improved health and well-being, 14.4% reduction in GP visits. Um, so really good numbers. Um, but we were conscious that we asked that question. And I suppose if your child comes home with a cake that they've baked at school and, and you taste it and they ask you if it tastes nice, sometimes you might not give the, the, the real true answer. And because we were asking the question, we had to be sure that we were getting an, an honest answer. And so what, what drove us to data was we were contacted by a university studying social isolation amongst all the people. And they said we were the best example they could find worldwide. And this is just four people based in an office on Oldham Road in Rochdale. So they said, could they come and uh, see what we do firsthand and meet members and talk to members? And we said, absolutely. Um, and the university was the University of Osaka in Japan. So they flew into Rochdale, uh, came and saw what we did. Um, they, they wrote a glowing report, sent it to us, but they sent it to us in Japanese. So it took two months to get that translated. Uh, but what they said, it was, it, they didn't feel they'd walked into anything clinical. It was very um, like walking into a group of friends out on a social event. So we were really pleased with that, but that sort of uh, um, planted the seed of does circle work and how can we prove that? So we got in contact with universities um, and I think it was as Lucy has just said, most organisations, certainly of our scale, haven't got a research department. Um, so we, con we worked with uh, the University of Manchester and also Manchester Metropolitan University who have a, a fabulous Q-Steps Q programme. So for the last, this is our fourth year now with, with MMU, we were able to get a student doing a, a quantitative study on the impact of our work. So year one was the impact of being a member of Circle. Year two was the impact of being a member of the volunteer drive service. And year three was um, being a volunteer with Circle. So all, all that research, we, we would never have the, the time, the opportunity um, or the wherewithal, if, if we're perfectly honest, to, to sort of pull together. What that, that research does, it gives you uh, an analytical uh, and as near unbiased analysis of what you do as, is, as you possibly can. By doing that, you obviously open your, or expose yourself to, to possible criticism. You, all them nice things, they may not actually work. Luckily, the, the majority of the, the reports come back with really positive stuff. What they also do is give you advice and recommendations on the, uh, the gaps in your system. So that is, that is vital in terms of accessing funding. Subsequent to that, we've done uh, reports on special projects that we've done with Rochdale Borough Wide Housing in their independent living scheme. How we expand the model and monetize the model and, and make it sustainable. We've also done some stuff with the Uni University of the United Nations based in Brussels around our use of tech. So we use, we're, we're a big advocate of the use of tech in, in all the things we do. We've also done some stuff around co-production uh, and people powered. We, we were featured on a on people powered projects. So people where the members drive the decision making of the organization. So all that then gives you a huge base to build your funding applications. As an organization, only about 20% of our income comes from the local authority. We, we, um, we do contracted work with different people because we can evidence that what we do makes a difference. I think that's the key to why you would use data. It, it, it makes a difference to people's lives and it also helps you to sustain the organization. Because at the, the end of the day, you, the only way you can do good is to be there. And the only way you can be there is by making sure that you can pay your bills. So that uh, all this um, university work has led us to get a huge amount of recognition for, for again, just this small organization based on Oldham Road in Rochdale. Um, with, if you go on the government website for CICs, we're, we're, we're hailed as a, a good, a, a best practice. Um, we, we've done different rewards. We're in, it, we've, we've won stuff that we're, we're recognized alongside the private sector as, as innovators in our field. It led to us being the Greater Manchester Social Enterprise of the year at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. And obviously that's a, all that ties back to working with the data sets. We don't do, we don't do that. We get the universities to do it. And there's, there's a huge uh, untapped layer before us, if you will, that'll, that'll help deliver uh, positive change to social enterprises. That then 
helps grow your influence and your, your, your outreach, if you will. So we did. Mark, we, one yeah. minute, please. One yeah, minute. Yeah, we there, thankfully. Um, that we, we, um, as we said, we've got the, the University of Osaka in Japan came to see us. We've had six different delegations from South Korea, including we made a documentary for South Korean TV. We've had visitors from the US plus all, all over the UK. Um, and to go back to the questions I asked at the start. So, and the reason why I asked them is, one, where would you go for a coffee with your friends? And most people would say Costa or Starbucks or some small independent. But when we came, uh, when we launched Circle about eight, eight, nine years ago, that the offer to all the people was, was a coffee in a community center. Now we use community centers, we still do, and we'll continue to do, but that was the only offer. But absolutely most people don't pick that as their first choice. So we had to, to develop that offer. Why I say um, about the sex pistols, my, my youngest daughter's missing going to concerts. She's 26. The 26 year old who attended the Sex Pistols concert is now 70. So the offer to older people has to change to reflect what an older person now is. And the, the Cavern Club, the 26 year old who attended the, the concert of the, the last concert of the Cavern Club of the Beatles is now in their 80s. So I just wanted to sh show and define what um, an older person now, now is, if you will. So, but we always come back to this does circle make a difference and that's why any organization does the work you do make a difference and that's why data um is so important so apologies for the glitch at the beginning but hopefully um it's all worked out in the end that's great thank you mark and now we're going to hear um another case study this time from the Ethnic Health Forum. Um, so Hanif's going to tell us about the work that they do there. Hi, good morning, or afternoon now, actually. Hello. Hi, Lucy, can you hear me? Or? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, I'm gonna be pretty, pretty, uh, pretty quick and short. Really, the question for us was, uh, uh, what were the, what is it that we were not doing? And uh, I think about it two years ago, we were delivering services without, with minimal funding. So we had few small pots of funding in a thousand pound year, 2000 from there, 500. So we were toddling along, but over that period, we then started to say, actually, if we are to develop as an organization, we need to, have some hard evidence. So we kind of very crudely started to record stuff we were doing. So lots of people were coming into the organization and mainly started off with welfare rights advice. So slowly but surely we, and again, we were always lack of staff, very small organization. We're still only a four part-time staff team who provide welfare rights and other li limited services. Uh, often we were lucky we had a good volunteer as well who helped us to get the data together so anyway what the message that I really want to share is how a small organization can actually use data information and as Lucy mentioned early data is gold dust I think for us putting that sentence or one by line is really the crux of it. So I think we've learned over the years to make good use of the data and information, which actually helped us to build a good case for when we approached funders. So we were, our major funding came almost 18 months ago with the Net Community Fund lotteries. We had a number of meetings and actually we, at our first meeting, we presented these slides to the officers who visited us. Uh, and basically they saw for themselves to say, here is a small organization doing really good work across root level, but they are struggling. Uh, and really it was a simple request to them to say, we've done this, these are our statistics and we need some funding to employ paid staff who can actually deliver a consistent uh, consistent uh, service which meets relevant standards 
you know, and the client or service user, when he or she comes in, gets the type of service that they deserve. So this is a very crude slide, but I think this was the beginning of our our journey. Um, and we have we have uh, tweaked this now. These were the initial categories, you know, employment support, welfare benefits, home office cases that we were either helping clients, uh, how many referrals from the NHS, how many from the Manchester City Council related in terms of, you know, Manchester City Council or what was it? You know, we had families who needed filling in a form. So that would go in education. It wasn't the perfect way to monitor and evaluate, but I think this was the start of it. We have improved the way we collect data much efficiently now as we have developed. Uh, next slide, please, Lucy, if there is the other one. Okay. This was an interesting one. You know, this clearly gave the, the officers from the community fund. And in fact, we use this with other possible officers of the health services, NHS, local authority. When we have a meeting, we actually present real live data going back three months or six months and say, these are the type of cases we are, we are seeing and we have broken down. So this was actually a slide going back almost 18 months ago. We have actually now improved the way. So these categories you see here, which are maybe about 10, 12 categories have actually have become more like 20 odd plus categories. So we are much better at breaking down exact reason why an individual has come to us or referred to us. So again, data is gold dust, is how you use it to make a case, you know, to make a case for, you know, support, to make your own case, to say actually what you're doing is making a difference. And part of this learning journey with our staff to make them, help them understand why are we collecting? Often we had the questions we have now as well, you know, staff is saying, why you want this? Why you want to, why you want to ask this? Why you want to collect this? And I think if you, I think once you, ex, once you help them understand the whole reason behind this, they are much likely to actually be with you. Um, so again, uh, statistics, very useful. So all these things we were not doing before. And I think the, again, the point is, if you are a small organization, capacity is an issue, but I think any small organization need, needs to have some kind of system or help or support to actually capture and reach the stage. And one thing I've learned is you don't need to be a, uh, you don't need to have, you know, you don't need to be an expert. You know, sometimes stuff like this actually, as you know, a student who is in a, his or her final year of studies at the university can actually uh come up with this type of analysis you know once you've once you've given them the data information it's time consuming but they can actually help you prepare this so we've been lucky in that sense uh, next slide please lucy if there is a next slide uh, okay um this is again uh Sorry, there are only two slides. Um, okay, if you just yeah. go back on the second slide that was on the, that we were seeing. Uh, have I got another minute, Suzanne? Um, yeah, a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, so really the key message was, you know, is how a small organization like ourselves have, have, have managed to make a case. Uh, and we have actually convinced the funders so after having shown, shown these slides plus others, the lottery grant officers were very, very, very well impressed and said, okay, we would like some more further information. But actually at the back of their mind, they went away and said, actually, here's a small organization in the heart of the community. We are in the M14 postcode covering Russia, Mossad, Hume. And you know, they, there wasn't an organization providing a welfare rights advisory service. You know, we made the application and we've got our basic first grant, you know, a three-year grant 
which actually at the moment is covering, uh, you know, salaries for three part-time staff. Uh, and we have built on that actually. Uh, so yeah, I think presenting and, you know, collecting good information, data makes a good business case as evidence for any organization who are growing and developing really. Um, and we would we are always interested in partnership work with organizations across Greater Manchester. I was very very uh, glad. I mean, I heard my, the previous speakers and uh, the Rochdale organization. I think they have done a fantastic job. I think I would we would like to aspire to get to that stage, uh, and it would be good to touch base with them at some stage. Equally, you know, developing links and partnerships is a way forward. So currently we're also involved in a number of interesting projects, uh, working with University of Oxford and Warwick on a, quite a big uh, national piece of work uh, around developing an app uh, to, to monitor data around mental health, which is work in progress with, I think the Bio University of Oxford Department of Biodata and Warwick's uh, IT department. So we are quite in innovative in that sense as well. We kind of think outside the box, you know, like to create new partnerships with uh, local partners and, you know, partners across the country as well. Uh, happy to answer any questions via email or, you know, I'm sure Suzanne and her team will share contact details later on. So I much appreciated the opportunity given to us today to share our experience. Yes, thanks, Hanif. Um, and I think just now we're going to switch back to Lucy for um, just a bit of a sort of demonstration of how the data can be used. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm just going to get my uh, screen up and then we'll have a look at that. Let's go to slideshow. Slideshow. Okay, so uh, yeah, um, so thanks for Mark and Hanif because they're underlining uh, a lot of messages here. <laughs> so what I'm going to do with this um, presentation very quickly is to just give you an example of how some, some of the findings can really work for your service um, and, and show you stuff that perhaps you weren't predicting. So. So making sense of data, this is an example from um, an unnamed alcohol detoxification service in the Northwest. Um, this service particularly prides itself on being able to reach out to uh, socially excluded and the more vulnerable um, people who are going to be using the service. So that's an important point. That is their raison d'etre. So what they wanted to do was to look at how their service was supporting people to complete uh, an inpatient detoxification. That is to, to stay long enough to, um, to have been detox, detoxificated safely. Um, okay, so a little bit of background is that, um, why is this not going to the next one? My screen doesn't seem to be going to the next slide for some reason. This is weird. Ah, okay. Okay. So, um, what was introduced in, in, the, in, the, in the, an area in the Northwest as um, a group of, of services that were providing detoxification for um, people who were alcohol dependent was a screening process. So this was introduced to lots of services providing these, uh, these um, needs in this area. So this service had to go over to a screening process. So in other words, people were screened before they gained admission to the service. So we're calling this here um, an open referral, what they used to do. People used to be able to walk through the door and say, I need to detox or um, a screening process that they called gatekeeping. So somebody would come into the service, be interviewed, 
and then either admitted or put on a waiting list or sent somewhere else. So they collected data on who was using the service during open referral um, process and during the gatekeeping process. So they asked us at uh, ManMet to examine this database uh, to have a look at client admissions. So we all we simply compared the data for direct admission, people who could just get in through open referral to people who had been screened. And then they also had records on who had completed treatment and had a planned discharge. That is, they were, they were sober, they were detoxed, they were perhaps put in touch with continuing services compared to people who had an unplanned discharge. That is, <clears throat> they probably left. They said, oh, I don't like this anymore. I'm going home, um, probably to drink, uh, or had some other reason that they needed to be discharged, um, possibly bringing alcohol into the premises and things like that. So we compared the gate kit kept data and the open referral data against what type of discharge people had. So very simple, really simple um, a two by two uh, examination of the data. We simply looked at that in terms of percentages. So as this table can show, it's a two by two table. There's gate kept people who had a black planned discharge and that was at 79 percent of gate kept people had a planned discharge against 20 percent who had an unplanned discharge they ever left or they were asked to leave and then we can compare that with the people who had an open referral and as we can see only 72 percent 73 percent had a planned discharge against 27 percent who had an unplanned discharge so just by eyeballing this data, it does look like that gatekeeping improves the rate of planned discharge. I'm hoping you'll all agree with that. Um, it's not a lot, but the, we had a lot of uh, a big sample size. So it was actually a significant difference. So what we also looked at was those very valuable demographics. We looked at people's age, their unemployment status, their gender, their housing type, their ethnicity, and the SADQ is the um, substance abuse um, dis disability questionnaire. Oh, severity of alcohol disorder questionnaire, I'm sorry. But it basically shows um, how, how much of a problem alcohol is for these people. And then we took one by one, we looked at those and looked at su successful discharge compared to unsuccessful or unplanned discharge, the dropouts and asked to leave, etc. And lo and behold, what we found was that there was a difference in demographics of who was having a planned discharge. So just as an example here, let's take gender for every one male um, for, as open in open uh, open referral 1.28 uh, women were having a planned discharge compared with in the gate kept, kept the ratio of men to women goes up for women so for every let's say 100 men there are now 162 women as compared to 128 women age Gate keeping is, as you can see, they're valuing people over 45. So for every 100 people under 45, there are now 144 people having a successful discharge um, under the gatekeeping system. Employment didn't, uh, it was, was a bit of a strange one that went the other way. But for housing, again, people with stable housing were being more successful with gatekeeping than people with unstable housing. So I think we've got a poll here. Um, I don't know if Lucy North can put it up or um, just to ask some questions 
on what you think this data tells us and you can tick on on whatever things you think are are true or what, what the evidence you think is uh, telling us here I see, I see that uh, a lot of people are agreeing with uh, gatekeeping, gatekeeping improving the service's efficiency. So, yeah, this data would look good, wouldn't it, to a funder? You'd be able to say, look, we're being really efficient with our gatekeeping. Is gatekeeping making the most of the service's resources? Possibly, because we're not wasting, wasting uh, resources on people who are going to drop out. Okay, is gatekeeping making it harder for those with most needs to access the service? Well, if we can see here that our is the results. Okay, so most people are tending to go with the efficiency. Absolutely. Okay, so can we stop sharing the results now? I think if we finished. Okay, so in effect, all those answers could be true. It does just depend on which way you look at it and what you value for your service. Now, remember at the beginning, I said that this service, its sort of mission statement, its raison d'etre, was to reach out and help people who were the most needy, the people with severe alcohol problems, the people with unstable housing, the people who found it difficult to get into services elsewhere. So while we can say yes, we've got uh, we've got gate we've got gatekeeping now, we're being really efficient. We can also show our funders the data on how that gatekeeping is actually producing a barrier to people to access our service. So what this service could uh, advertise for its its services and for more funding is perhaps that if they get rid of the gatekeeping, which is exactly what they did, <laughs> they start they went back to open referral and started getting more of those people who were more vulnerable. And they could demonstrate then that because we've got an open referral system, we are able to help more people who are, are actually in greater need. Okay, so I think I've got another slide here, but uh, which confirms that, which is not working again. Don't know why that doesn't do that. Uh, but it basically summarizes that. So um, just to, to finish then, um, yeah, that basic data, you could see from these slides that we simply use the basic data that they were collecting as people came through the door. Um, we could have done a financial analysis as well, which um, which would have well, highlighted the um, the results. But for this service, it particularly focused on um, justifying what they were there for, why they were different to statutory services, for example. Okay, um, I'm going to leave it there, um, and we'll answer questions at a later.